All right, so welcome to the Center for Civic Leadership's workshop on letters for recommendation. We've got four stunning panelists here with us who uh, support the CCL through the fellowship process. So I'll have them introduce themselves uh, now. So why don't you start us off, Miki? I'm Miki Hebel. I'm in the Department of Psychological Sciences. I've been at Rice. This will be my 25th year. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here. I've written a lot of letters of recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And we can just move down the line, whoever wants to go next. Margarita, you want to go? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Margarita Castroman. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. Um, have been here only since 2020, but other institutions and before that high school. So I have also written many letter letters of recommendation for various stages and happy to be with you all today. And I'm, I'm Bilal Gassin. I'm a lecturer in bioengineering. I'm in my, this will be my 11th year starting next year at Rice. Um, and similar to the others, I've been involved with the Fellowship and Awards Committee for the last eight years, I think, or seven years. And I've written letters of recommendation for, you name it, I've written, written for it. So grad school, med school, jobs, fellowships, <laughs> lots of different things. So happy to, to help as much as we can. Uh, and then I'm Arley. I'm a uh, faculty in the computer science department here at Rice. I've been at Rice for two years now. Um, I haven't written or read that many letters, uh, but I like letters. So I, whenever I see them, I try to read. And I, so I'm excited about this panel. Maybe I would share some experience. And I would learn a little bit as well. So, yeah. Nice. nice. Awesome. Uh, and I'm Chris. I am with the Center for Civic Leadership, Assistant Director of Assessment, and also run the Center's Learning Program. I help a bit around with the fellowships too. Um, but why don't we get us started? So why don't uh, y'all talk us through what your recommendation in, what your recommendation is for students to kind of build relationships with faculty and staff in order to get the ball rolling on, you know, being ready to make that letter recommendation request. Sure, I'm happy to start if you want and then popcorn it to other people. Yeah, that's that's great. Easiest, and I'll, I'll try to be quick so that I don't say everything. And so I would just say <clears throat> faculty members have office hours and they have office hours for a reason. That's part of our job. And our job is to have faculty office hours for helping students learn more about the topic and the topics that they're having trouble with in a particular class and to learn more about the field, right? So there is nothing more exciting for me to have a student come and say, I'm interested in psychology. How might I, what sorts of things could I study? How might I go to graduate school? How do you think I could, you know, get better at it, okay? To me, that is such a joy. That's the biggest joy. The worst joy is when people grade grub about one or two tiny things. But when they come in and they want to know more about graduate school, that to me is awesome. So what I would say to students is use office hours. You are going to need three-ish letters of recommendations. And the more that a faculty knows you on a personal and professional level, the better your letter of recommendation is going to be and the more they are going to assist you in being a better candidate for whatever it is that you want to do. Margarita, I'm going to popcorn it to you. Yeah, I'll pick up from there. Office hours for sure. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a different um, kind of bent to it, which is I often have students um, in the STEM field. I'm an English professor, so they're coming to my office hours, not necessarily for the graduate school conversation, but they're coming because they wanna improve their writing and they're sharing with me maybe why this particular topic is relevant to why they're studying what they're studying. And those conversations are the ones that I remember when it comes time for a letter of recommendation. So if it's if you're looking for what paper topic I will grade, you think I will grade more favorably, that conversation doesn't really develop a rapport. I don't really get to see kind of your um, your own passions come out. But if you're saying I'm really invested in the environment and I'd love to bring that into this class, how can we do that? And then we get to have that kind of collaborative experience of building up kind of ideas and so forth. Those office hours I find so incredibly productive. I love the ones when it's students 
one talk to me about law school and how English is going to work into that or graduate school. But I also really love the STEM students who are sitting there wanting to be better writers and wanting to kind of showing me why they're so invested in what they're invested in. And, and kind of to pick up on that, uh, especially in STEM field uh, courses, the classes can tend to be very large in size. So students really uh, need to distinguish themselves. And that doesn't mean you have to be you know, overbearing or anything like that, but being interactive in class, asking questions about the material, showing that you're interested in learning more. And as Dr. Hubble said, kind of talking to us about who you want to be, what you want to do, make a connection. So we have a personal connection to you. And remember, remember somebody if they're 50, you know, in a class of 50 or even sometimes 200 students, it's hard to remember everybody. So, you know, building that kind of rapport, that connection can help a lot so that we can actually speak to your to your personal character rather than just, they got an A in my class. Um, yes, no, I, I agree with everyone said. I think that, uh, like, I guess as a student, you can always try to excel at one, um, like taking one of your undergrad classes and, and then you're gonna get a letter that basically is going to look like hey this student did really well it was like you know top 10 one of the top 10 students that took this class you know did really well in the finals and things like that you should come to my office hours and had very interesting questions i think that if you take a graduate class which are smaller class you have a chance to do something like a project and then your letter can be about your project and how your project was very exciting how you sort of like found some uh, challenges and how you overcame them uh the next level would be if you maybe spend the summer doing research with the faculty, especially in STEM, that's very interesting. And then your letter will be like, I gave a problem to the student. It was a very hard problem. The student did great. Publish a paper about this. And this is, I think, the best letter you can get. If you're plan planning for grad school, of course, or for trying to show that you did uh, research and you have research experience. So they're like these levels. And I think you you won't have all the letters to, to fit, fit in the last case, but I guess it's always good to have letters covering all these cases. and. Uh, so you should optimize for have to have like some of this. I mean, I'm talking mostly about grad school, but of course the other letters might matter more depending on whether you're going to med school and things like that. Thanks, y'all. Great insight. Uh, Ryan has a question for us here. So he's saying that he's realized recently that it can be useful to provide extra materials, you know, beyond the typical CV or resume, such as bullet points about how y'all have interacted before, information about things that he's applying to or kind of his personal perspective. And he's not really sure which is the most useful to share or what might be too much. And he'd appreciate any advice on like how much of that extra material would be helpful to share with the offer of the letter writing process. You can start, Nikki. Margarita, you start this time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's such a great question, Ryan. And I appreciate that you're already recognizing that there might be too much up front. And I think that is a really wise and kind of astute insight because sometimes it is like I haven't even agreed yet. And it's like all the stuff. <laughs> Um, I think first, it's kind of, would you be willing to do this? Here's the timeline. This is what I'm thinking, kind of a general sense. Maybe attach at that point if you want the resume. I mean, but keep that one kind of um, succinct and then say, here are the materials and list them. I have this and this and this that I can offer if that is helpful to you. And most likely, if it's someone like me, I will say yes, send that along. I'd love to read that. But I have gotten cases where students who just send me like six files at once. And I'm like, it just feels like a lot on the first, especially if they haven't come to office hours, if this feels out of the blue, it can be like a lot on the first kind of go. So maybe pace it a little bit um, would be my suggestion, but have it ready to go so that if they ask for it, yes, send it. You're like, it's coming straight down the pipe. Like it's not something that you have to necessarily wait too long to send. And, and depending, it really just depends on what you're applying for, right? Some materials will be useful. So if somebody's applying to med school, obviously their personal statement is really helpful because it allows me to make sure that if there are things they're highlighting about themselves in their application that I can actually highlight in my letter, that really helps kind of, you know, go full circle for them with the committee that's reviewing it. Um, but other times it's just getting to know you a little better just but yeah I, I highly recommend being very succinct like like margarita said in the in the initial contact and then asking them if there are specific things that they would like you don't have to necessarily bombard them with a bunch of files but just say is there anything i could put together that would help you and that can oftentimes make it easier than, than trying to guess what you think they need so it's okay to just ask we'll, we'll be pretty blunt as long as you give enough time 
usually the person that's that's probably the biggest factor is making sure you give people enough time and then that'll help Nikki, do you have any insight on this yes i wanted to wait my turn and let ariel go first yeah okay so uh i think that the advice that was given is very useful so i think so usually when i write the letter what i ask the students is their cv their research statement or the personal statement and I asked for the transcript. And I think like uh, as uh, was mentioned um, by Bilal, I think it's at the, you know, like it's the, I think the statement is one of the very important ones because I wanna make sure that what the student is trying to highlight in their application, I, I also can match that with my experience working with the student. I know, of course, like, like it was said before, this was like faculty to faculty, they would ask different amounts of information in different levels. I know people that ask for a draft of the letter, I don't like to do that. I like to write my own letters, but you wouldn't be, I guess, don't be surprised if someone asks you to draft the letter and then they would just sort of like change the wording and things like that. And uh, yeah, but so yeah, it really depends on the faculty, but I think the yeah, giving enough time is really important. Otherwise the letter won't look great, even if the faculty tries to write it like you know, very late in the night before the deadline. So you don't want to be in that situation. And I would just add, I, I agree with everything that's been said. The first thing is, the last thing you wanna do is come off as being presumptuous and here's all my stuff, do it. And that's one way to really make sure that you're only gonna get a, a partially good letter. But I think if you ask and you ask ahead of time, and then to me, the next thing I do is I have a template that I actually send to students. And I say, you know, I wanna write you the best letter that I am capable of writing. And so if you want that letter, this is what I need. And then I say, the first thing I need is your resume or your Vita. The second thing I need is an unofficial transcript. Um, the third thing I need is your personal statement. So I understand exactly what program you're going to and why. The fourth thing I need is a reminder of the classes that you've taken with me. And not only a reminder of the classes, but a reminder of the class, the year, the semester in the year, and the grade that you got. And then I also say, if there was any particular thing that you did in that class, like if you wrote a paper, remind me what the paper was about. Or if you were a research assistant with me, remind me all the topics that you worked on during each of the semesters you were in the lab. And then I add one more thing, which is a two paragraph brag statement. And that is because I've done research on, letter, on biases in letters of recommendations. And what I wanna know is what are the words and what are the sorts of things that you would say about yourself. So I know what I say about you, but I sometimes also like to have this extra wording that I can use. So sometimes if it's really good and my students are so bright and the last thing they're gonna do is screw up the brag paragraphs, I can sometimes really adapt those to make sure that I'm catering to the special, um, the special, characteristics that students themselves believe they have. The final thing I do is I say, I need all the deadlines. I need it together in one email. I, we all get so many, just like you all students, we get inundated with emails. And the last thing I wanna do is piecemeal six different emails together. So it's really helpful, again, after we've agreed, to send it all in one big document. And then what I tell the students is, you know, I'm gonna do diligence and send you back a text or an email that says, I've completed your University of Minnesota, or I did these law schools or whatever it is so that they're aware that I'm doing it too. And I say to them, if you don't hear these from, if you don't hear back from me, that's a sign that you might want to gently nudge me. <laughs> and that's again, because, you know, I have 30 to 40 people in my lab. So I have, I write a lot of letters of recommendations. But to me, that sort of thing, you know, you might go, well, how, how come they need me to write 
all this stuff down. Well, the truth of the matter is you might be a lovely student, but there's a hundred other lovely students who are just like you over a four year period of time. So jogging our memory is never a bad thing. And just, just one thing to kind of add to that. Um, it's nice when you're, when you're giving the deadlines to also state like what kind of submission the letter is supposed to go through. Is it an email we're going to get? Is it that's a, to a link to submit it, or is it going to be something where we need to email a person? It just helps us know because if we don't get that email, sometimes it can slip our minds. Um, and so it's good to to give us that that ping in there that say, okay, you need to write a note in your calendar that this is due. An email is needs to be submitted to this person because it just it can get overwhelming at times, and we get busy, and it's not intentional, but like like Dr. Hevel said, if you get a ton of like requests and you're trying to go through all of them, it can, sometimes things can get lost in the cracks. So always ping us, but do it. Don't be like, oh my God, you haven't sent my email, my letter in. Can you do it right now? Um, but just do a nice gentle reminder a day or two before it's due for sure. And if not a week before saying just a reminder that this is coming, you know, thank you again for, for writing, but definitely, you know, be very courteous and not over, don't assume that they're going to write the letter for you and don't come off saying, Hey, I need you to write this letter for me. Do it now. <laughs> kind of mentality. Yeah. So you're always asking it and it's a favor that the faculty is doing for you. We'll all do it, but it is a favor. Yeah. Just, I think one advice also that, uh, I mean, I used this before and uh, it was very effective. And it's like, if you create a spreadsheet with all the applications that you have, and then the deadline, and then whether that sub that letter has been submitted or not. Then when you send a reminder, you can say like, okay, these are the letters. And then the fact you can easily see which letters are missing and then see like in your spam folder, whether there's some request that ended up there. So that really helps me. Like if you have that organized in a spreadsheet, instead of like just receiving an email, like one by one saying like, hey, this one, the deadline passed. So this one, the deadline is really close, things like that. So the spreadsheet is very, Yeah, I'll just jump in and add something. Also, if there's been, you all hear me, it says my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, okay. Um, if there's been a major change, um, I had a student, right, who changed their pronouns in between when they were in my class and what they're using to apply for graduate school. Make sure that you let me know that or your recommenders know that, right? If there's been a last name change, I had a student who changed their last name and it actually became really hard for me to kind of parse out because on my roster, it was different. So kind of highlight that, say like, also so that I can kind of piece those together and not kind of get lost in the weeds on some of those, um, those details that are incredibly important to students. And then I tell my students to give me um, a two week kind of reminder and then write a one week reminder if I haven't emailed you. I had a student this semester who emailed me, I think every three weeks and that was too much. So also be strategic in how often you send those gentle reminders. I think if you haven't heard, right, and it's been a while, <laughs> then maybe two weeks before, and then maybe one week before is fine in case people are traveling or so forth, but also be mindful not to inundate the like, hey, it still hasn't come in, it still hasn't come in. We'll get there, um, right? I, I haven't forgotten one yet, I doubt um, most of us kind of do. So gentle reminders that aren't um, too much. You wanna keep your, your recommenders really happy and excited to write that letter. Nice. I was going to add one more thing, too, that's just a, a really kind thing to do. So it used to be in the olden days, you would take down your letter and you'd give it to the secretary and the secretary would send out, you know, your letter to the 13 or 14 different places that you'd submit to. But now it's on the professor to go to your 13 different schools and put in each of the letters. And it's it's a little bit annoying because... Um, sometimes the letters take different forms or sometimes they're like, oh, now you can only use 800 characters or now you can only, and it's like, oh my God. But one thing that you can do that's just so helpful is fill out the top part of the form in as much detail as possible. So put down our names, find our addresses, find our emails, find, you know, the, our titles. If you're asking us, you certainly can find that information so that when we get to your one out of 14 files, all we have to do is the new part. Okay. So I just say that's a really kind thing for you to do for us. Amazing, y'all. Uh, Ryan's got a couple more questions for us and they align well with some of the topics we wanted to talk about. So 
I'll ask away on your behalf, Ryan. So Ryan's uh, next question is, um, is it advisable and or useful to provide particular points that he particularly wants to focus on? Um, what about aspects of his experience um, with the letter with the letter writer with the letter writer that the letter writer maybe doesn't have direct experience with? For example, I have a letter writer who has been involved with many of my leadership and service activities. Would it be appropriate to also ask him to highlight other leadership or service act, service activities he wasn't necessarily involved in? Bilal, you want to take that first? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think it's always it's always okay to just give us idea of kind of what you want us to highlight. I think that's always a positive. Um, as long as it's something that we can feel comfortable talking about, meaning like it's an area we feel we have the ability to give that kind of judgment or, or feedback, um, you know, just make sure it's not something that's outside of our wheelhouse in the sense of like, I, I can't really speak to this about you because I haven't seen it, right? So I think in that case, you don't wanna ask somebody to, to really speak onto something they don't know about you. But a lot of times, your, for example, if your character kind of in my in my interactions with you kind of show that your leadership skills or show that these clubs you were in or these activities you did would make sense, you know, I can you know speak onto that aspect, but I'm not gonna be able to speak specifically on those individual things unless you've talked to me about them. So. So I think there's definitely benefit in saying like, this is one thing I'm highlighting. It's kind of like why I said asking for the, and Dr. Hubble and everybody said like, giving us your personal statement's important because then we can highlight what we think will help reinforce that from our experience. So when there's not a, a personal statement or something similar, you can say like, this is kind of what I'm going for. Um, if you have any things you could kind of say to support that, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think that's fine as long as, you're not asking us to say something that we have no ability to really make a judgment on. Arlie, did you want to? You want to um, take yeah. So I agree. I think, uh, yeah, I think sometimes I, I feel like I'm in a situation where the student asks me to write something that basically I'll be just be reading the CV and writing my letter. And I think that's not the ideal situation. So like, hey, this student did this because I saw in this CV that the student did this. I look, I cannot add anything to that, right? I can say like, oh, look at the, the student did so many things. It's impressive, but this is not. So I think it's good when the faculty or the letter writer can say something beyond what you can write in your CV. So I think that's one. And, and I think it's also important to, to have some common sense again, like that in the sense that, because I have had situations where, say, the student didn't do well in my class and then came to me, so, hey, can you write me a recommendation letter? And I was like, hey, but you didn't do well in the class, and I cannot say, like, right, I'm going to, the only thing that we did together is that you took my class and you didn't do well, so what am I supposed to write? Like, right, so I think that's, uh, you have to be sort of, like, strategic in the sense that you need to have something, and it, it doesn't mean that you have to do well in all your classes, but when you go to a faculty and ask for a letter, I think one of the criteria that should account for is that the fact they should have nice things to say about you, right? Things that are going to make your application stronger. So I think that's a, uh, yeah, there's something else to keep in mind when you're asking for that. I think uh, Mar Margarita, I think. Uh, have you sure. Heard? Yeah, I had like a knee jerk reaction to, to the, the question, which is a good question. Um, I think it, I understand the desire to want to have kind of all the parts of your CV represented in the letters, but I think being very tactful. If you feel like this is a particular person who has enough experience with your leadership and service outside of class that they can bridge that, make that connection, that's one thing. I have had students try to have me speak to something where, again, to Bilal's point, I either don't know too much about, or I don't, you don't want to make your recommender feel like you're telling them, this is how I want you to write my letter, right? Um, you want it. So I think asking with tact, if it's a particular person is really just kind of finesse it so that it doesn't feel like you're trying to kind of control the message because you should trust hopefully that your relationship with this person, your time, what you've demonstrated is going to bring all of that out, even if it's not in the exact kind of language and way that you would have crafted. So just be kind of careful with that because I know my initial thing was like, well, I'm going to write the letter. Like I got you, it's fine. Um, but I don't want to dissuade you if it is someone that you think maybe is really specifically, particularly qualified to speak to something. And I would just add that I think when I write the letter, one of the reasons I want all these components is I kind of want to get the gestalt of the person and figure out 
what are they doing outside of like ideally so ariel you you gave an example that has happened and you're like shit what are you asking me to do and then the question becomes well maybe you're the best person they have and then in those situations depending on how much i like the student or how much time i have that week or how generous i feel sometimes i say well, let's go out for a coffee and talk. And so I'll try to get to know them a little bit, but it's hard sometimes because we're all so busy. And you know, the important thing for you to remember is you're just one of the many, many people who are writing letters for, you know, that we're writing letters for. But one of the things I do try to do in my letters is actually get a sense of what you are doing outside of the context I see you in. So I actually am a little bit different from what I've heard said so far, I do comment oftentimes on what I see on the um, uh, on the transcript. So if I see that somebody's pre-med or I see that somebody's taken like classes, like somebody's taken Chinese or somebody's taken some classes that I think are really unique or are stretching people, sometimes I say, you know, they have a 3.89. And this is in spite of the fact that they're taking really hard classes such as blank and blank. So I'll try to highlight certain things or I'll say, you know, this is their experience in the lab outside of my lab. They're also involved in, and I'll list some of those things. And it's not necessarily just a regurgitation of what they have on their resume, but I'm trying to highlight and make sure that if something is really extraordinary, then I am hitting them again with it. So in terms of your question, Ryan, I don't think it's bad to at all say, you know, one of the things I was gonna hope for is I've had you for stats and for mathematics. And what I was really hoping you would do was emphasize my statistical knowledge. I don't think that's a problem at all. And I think you can also say, you know, I really, this position is about leadership and I just wanted you to know I'm a leader in this, this, and this, and then you've seen me in this leadership context. I don't, again, think that's so bad to me. I'd be like, let me tell you what this guy has done and how I've seen him in the leadership thing. And then I might at the end say, outside of the capacity that I've seen him in, I know that he's also doing this, this, and this as well. So I don't think that's a problem. I think you get into a problem when you do try to write the letter for the person or say, and make sure you do this, this, and this. Okay, so I think you really wanna hear the cues of when the professor says, what can, what, what can, uh, this is what you can give me to be helpful, you know? Yeah, and I agree. I think, I think, you know, and, and to clarify what I meant was just is mainly like you don't want to ask them to go way outside their box where they have no ability, like I said, to make that judgment. But if I'm saying, OK, I've seen this student in the lab, seen him in class, they've been doing great. They've taken on team leadership and they're doing all this while doing all these and really great in my class while doing all these other activities, which are very time involved. So it really shows a strong student Yeah, that that will definitely be something that can help. Um, and then just giving us like what your, like I said, what your goal is for the letter can help. Um, and, and then just kind of give us a little bit of insight of what you're hoping for. Yeah. I think as long as it doesn't come off as I need you to write a letter that says this, you're always going to be okay. So as long as you're not seeming to be pushing it, I, I think that's the safe bet. But always giving us more direction or option opportunity to kind of, kind of see that it can help a lot of times our letters not be generic. Sometimes and, and and fit more what your interests are for your application specifically. Cool. Uh, just want, can I can I just add something? Yeah, I think it's something. Yeah, I really like the comments. Like I think one thing that I notice sometimes. I mean about this, like when you can give uh, guidance on what you want in your letter. I mean, I have in my experience, which is very short. I have seen two cases. One, the student has no clue what should go in the letter. And the other one is the student has a kind of like misguided uh, view on what should go in the letter, like what other people would like to see in the letter. And at least you should be able to hear some feedback like about those as well. Like, I, I haven't seen like many cases of the student who actually can like teach me how to write a good letter for them. Like, because again, you haven't read letters, like so you, you probably haven't seen many of those. So I think that you should be open also to 
sort of like, okay, so reframe the way that you sell yourself or reframe what you think your letter should look like based on people that have been reading these letters for some time and have been writing them for some time. Awesome advice, y'all. Uh, we've got a couple questions around um, deadlines and timelines, which I know we've touched on a bit earlier, but um, is it advisable to give early deadlines to uh, letter writers or is that a little bit dishonest? And then, you know, tailored to that is if you do have a bunch of applications and you know that you're going to be sending out quite a few letter requests, um, how can you go about asking those so it's not overwhelming for letter writers? Um, want, uh, maybe I can start this time. So at least I mean, I, I write a lot of letters for graduate school and then those letters, usually the students will be applying for like something between 10 and 30 different schools. So for me, what helps is like, okay, this is the list of schools where I'm going to be applying. These are the deadlines. And um, right, and I can, if it's on a spreadsheet and there's like a marker on like uh, where, like, I think it's a kind of like having a fake deadline might be not great because uh, someone might kind of like, you know, like write that letter overnight to make sure to make the deadline just to find next that that deadline actually didn't exist. And like, well, I could be sleeping and I could have written the next day. So I wouldn't do that. I think it's good to be honest with the deadlines and uh, maybe you want to say like, hey, you know, it would be great if like, you know, I can submit everything maybe one week earlier just like for safety or maybe like three days earlier just for safety in case, you know, like people don't have internet on that day of the deadline and things like that. But I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't have a fake deadline. Yeah, I wouldn't do a fake deadline either because we can often see the deadline when we log into these anyway. So it's it, I, to your, to um, at this point that you're going to log in and be like, oh, I could have been doing this tomorrow. So you, again, nothing that's going to maybe set someone to be a little grumpy. You just don't want a grumpy letter writer. Um, and then for the spreadsheet, I've the most effective sort of methods for the spreadsheet is to not send me the spreadsheet that you are using for all of your materials. Cause I've had students send me the spreadsheet. That's like everything that they need for every school. And then I don't see what I need, which is just right. The like name of the school, the, the deadline, maybe the two, is there a particular committee that I need to like address this to like give, make sure that that spreadsheet that you're sending your professors is synthesize so that it's really only what we need and not all of the different pieces of information that you're you're using which I know when I applied to grad school that spreadsheet was massive right so kind of pare it down so that it feels manageable and then send it um, either as a pdf because not everybody's using either excel or google docs and sometimes google docs for those of us who aren't as super comfortable with it isn't great so just a nice simple kind of easy doc um, I think would be your best bet for many schools Nikki, did you want to go next? I don't really have anything else to add. I, I think, you know, yeah, you, don't don't give a false deadline. I mean, if you want, if you're really concerned about it, you can say, geez, I was hoping to finish these because I was hoping to finish these like by the 15th, even though they're not due until the 22nd. That's as as far as I would go. Yeah, so on, on the fake deadline, I agree with everybody, I think. The only time I think it makes sense to not, not give a fake deadline, but is if you're applying to something that has rolling admissions, right? It's very easy for us to like, oh, it's a rolling admission and you lose track. And so sometimes the deadline on the form won't say rolling admissions. It says the final deadline up until the, um, so being very clear that, you know, this is a rolling admissions program. So the sooner you can get this in, the better obviously helps because most other places aren't going to look at anything until the deadline anyway. So there's no real advantage to getting it in early that's not a race um so you're not going to get priority it's not like getting onto a plane for southwest but the but the idea is what you will do is if you do do that and the faculty finds out that then it doesn't look good about one whether you trust them or not and two as arlie mentioned i may be rushing to write that letter amongst other deadlines and then i'm like oh it's due tonight and i'm not getting as good of a letter out um, and I'm not going to say I never write letters at the deadline because it happens most of the time. I just have a lot going on, but it, it is one thing not to panic. That's why I said like a lot of students panic and they're like, it's not in yet. I'm like, I have a deadline. I will get it in by the deadline. Don't worry. Um, but if you're, if you have a legitimate reason, as Dr. Hebel said, where it's like, 
look, I'm trying to get this in early and you know, there's a rolling deadline submission. So they're actually evaluating these on a rolling, rolling admissions session. Could you please get it? You know, if you could get it in earlier, that'd be great. You know, that's the kind of thing that makes sense. Um, but unless there's an early like rolling, I wouldn't push that. That's not something, that's not a challenge you want to take on <laughs> um, with somebody that's supposed to be writing about how they, you know, a beautiful picture of you that they have in their mind. Um, so, but yeah, no, definitely, yeah, follow what everybody else said. Oh, sorry. And on the on the case of the form, I agree with Margarita with you having like, I usually ask for, and, and this, I don't know if it's similar for the rest of y'all, but like a lot of times students are applying to programs with different names for the degree. Sometimes they're applying for master's and PhD. So being very clear what program you're applying to. So in my field, it's horrible because there's bioengineering, biomedical engineering, biological engineering, and they're all the same thing, but for some reason we all call them different names. But I don't want to say somebody's applying to the biomedical engineering program at this university, and then they're like, wait a minute, this is a copy and pasted letter, even though it was just the wrong program. So making sure that what the program is, maybe even a couple of sentence blurb of what actually the program is, if it's not like a grad school um, type thing. So things like that just help, but you don't need to have like a massive amount of information, just deadline, form, how it's being submitted. Um, and the school and the name and the name of the program or specific degree program. And I would watch out also for time zones. So if you're applying to somewhere that has a deadline in a different time zone, kind of make make us aware of that. So yeah. kind of highlight what the maybe what the it says on the website, um, and then kind of remind us because sometimes that that can get a little tricky. Yeah. Otherwise, we're assuming eleven fifty nine Eastern is the time, <laughs> even though we might have a few more hours. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can talk through how students could use uh, the letter writing as an opportunity, as a growth opportunity itself. Like, how can it be an opportunity for mentorship, for for learning, as opposed to just something that's transactional that's happening between the faculty and the and the student? Mickey, you want to? Sure. I want to make sure I understand you. So how can they benefit from this letter writing experience? Yeah. Even though there be, well, I mean, I, again, think that ideally, the more we know the student, the stronger and the better they're going to fare on the letter. So for me, uh, you know, I don't want it to be totally transactional. I'm just getting to know you because I want a good letter what I think is really beneficial for the student is if they get to know the professor who's writing them a letter because they've done work in their lab or because they've gone to their office and tried to find out about the field or because they've sought, you know, when I'm working with my students, a lot of times if they're getting a letter in my field, I've actually come up with the list with them, or I've told them, here's who you might want to include on your list. So I try to take a very developmental approach. And those are people who generally ask me for, I, there's kind of like two different sort of categories. One is the people who don't know me that well, but have done well in my class and are just going to ask for that letter. And those are harder to write because it's just like I don't know as much and for me I'm still going to do diligence and ask them for the paragraph about themselves for any special and and thankfully in my classes there are papers that they do or projects so I can talk about those but the other group is much more of a you know hopefully through this letter writing experience they're thinking about you know again how would they brag about themselves they're thinking about like what, you know, why are they going to these programs? So if I ask for the personal statement, you know, hopefully that forces them again to be more thoughtful about who they are, where they're headed and why these particular programs, um, you know, and I think a lot of people don't apply for awards and don't do um, certain things that they that they could be eligible to win because the process does take a long time. But I think in all of these processes, when you are applying for things, you get to know yourself better and you get to know what it is you want and what it is you don't want. And I think 
you know, you're smarter. So even if you don't get the low and stern this year, you might get it next year and you get to be smarter about the process. Or, you know, if you get rejected, you may learn, oh, I, I didn't do this one thing that I'm going to do better. You know, I know a lot of students will also talk about how if they're sending to 13 different schools or something, they'll go back and they'll look and they'll go, oh my God, I put Michigan State instead of, you know, Columbia. I forgot to change it. So, you know, I think it's just like they're asking us to be diligent, hopefully in the process, they're being really diligent and careful. So that's what I'd say. I would say as an English um, professor, I appreciate, I've had some really good experiences with students who the semester before they even ask me for the letter, they say, would you, could we sit and talk about my diversity statement? Or could we sit and talk about my personal statement? And it gives us a chance to have a conversation that does not feel, um, I mean, yes, they're asking for favor. And I'm not saying that that always works or that I necessarily always want that. But I do think for some students, it's been really helpful because it shows that they want to actually send out the best version of themselves, that they trust me to help them kind of in this process. I get to know them so much better. And then when it comes to asking the letter, I'm like, of course, I'm going to write your letter. Like, I know so much about you. Like, this has been a great experience. Yes, let's do it. So I do versus students who sometimes ask me in a very transactional way, like you're going to say that I'm a good writer. And then they send me these materials and I'm like, no one has looked at these materials. Right. And you haven't given me the space to say, if you see something or if I'm still open to suggestions, because sometimes I read some personal statements or I read some diversity statements and I'm like, oh, no, this shouldn't be it. But they haven't opened that kind of door for me to be able to speak into that and then build more of that kind of rapport and kind of grow even the application itself. So I think maybe instead of feeling like it's already tight, just write me the letter. That's all I need. Being open to saying if there's anything that you think that I should highlight more, I'd love to hear that feels like a, a, an invitation um, rather than that kind of transaction. Yeah, and I agree agree with that, you know, kind of building off what you can learn from our experience and, and using that to improve your part of the application. I think, too, just using it as an opportunity to grow, especially if you're asking for letters early on in your career, maybe sophomore, freshman, sophomore year or junior year. Use it as, a, as an in to kind of get to know us a little better, to give you advice, maybe on career paths, on other things you can apply to. And like Dr. Bill said, like there may be things you're eligible for in our field that you don't think about, like awards or fellowships. And, and this has been happening more often where I tell my students, like, look, there's these great fellowship opportunities that Rice nominates students for the Churchill, the Goldwater, you know, uh, Fulbright. And, and you should think about this. You should consider if you're doing Are you thinking about doing a gap year? Is this something you want to do? In the meantime, right, uh, you know, these are opportunities to not just make you a better applicant in the long run, but just to help you develop as a human being. And we all get into academia with the idea of developing a person, not just teaching them one thing. We want to develop the whole human being. And part of that comes with getting to know you and seeing how you are as a person and, and really helping you grow. And, and sometimes it's not much for some students. And sometimes the student, you just see the transition and, and how, they, how they grow so much just in a few conversations because they, they just didn't know or they didn't experience it. But yeah, but definitely I'm happy. I'm always happy to help my students with their like statements of purpose and things like that, but making sure that I'm not going to be like stepping on your toes and making you feel uncomfortable because you think I'm grading your you know application, which is not what it's supposed to be. But, but if you want my feedback, I'm always happy to give it just kind of make sure that I, I'm aware that you want that type of information. Yeah, no, I think yeah, like, I think that the, the the part of like basically making us one of your like allies in your application, I think is very smart way to do it. Like, I think sometimes that happens naturally. Like, there are students in my program that I'm asking them like, hey, when I'm gonna write that letter? Like, because I'm so excited for them when they apply for grad school. Like that, you know, like because I met them, you know, presenting a poster somewhere, and you know, and I and I know them, and like you know, I. You know, whenever they you know they present a poster, they come to my office and say like, "Hey, I'm doing this research and I want to know about this." That's the the best case. So I, I would write those letters like easily. You know, it would be the easiest ones to write. I already know these letters have been being written over months. You know, like, and I think that of course that won't happen all the time. But I like when a student, for instance, come to my office and say like, "Hey, I want to take your class as a graduate class because I'm applying for grad school, and I think like you know this class is gonna sort of like complement the story that I want to tell about my." 
the my trajectory and uh, so we know like while the student is taking the class i'm already thinking okay this is like this is something i could write in the letter you know it's not like something like surprise you know like like hey i want this letter it's something that and then like like was said before like that gives me a chance to say like oh you know what i think you should also maybe you should consider taking this class you know or maybe like you know are you applying for a like a business school like for an mba like have you thought about taking some class in the you know, management, you know, have you thought about like, you know, having a summer project on that topic? I mean, I think it's nice when, because I have had cases where the student came to me and I had like clear advice that would be very useful six months earlier, but at that time it was completely useless. But, you know, when I was writing the letter, I, like I had to like, you know, help myself to not write, like, you know, I wish they still had done this, which should we like, you know, it was, so I think is if you have a chance to avoid that, just show up earlier to the faculty's uh, office and ask for advice and if you don't get any it's fine but you know you might get something helpful and then you know like th that is going to show in your letter like as you like being proactive and actually following advice and I think that's a good quality that uh, you might want to show in your application as well. Amazing y'all we've got two final questions and then we'll close it out uh, for us. So next question is. Um, I know there's been a lot of mention around, you know, making sure that you bring in your your personal statement or your two bragging paragraphs uh, to kind of support with the letter writing. Uh, what would be a good substitute if the, the student doesn't necessarily have a personal statement ready yet and they haven't kind of worked on a draft, but they're they're asking for the letter? I'll start, I guess. Um, I'm just going to be blunt. I wait for the personal statement. So rarely do is the deadline for the letter of recommendation before the personal statement. Um, I just, if you want me to write like a really good letter, I, I, I kind of need, if not, then a draft of the personal statement. Like I need a sense of why you're doing what you're doing, what you're going after. Otherwise, my letter is going to feel sterile and kind of just clinical. And it's not really going to feel very personal because I didn't get that from you yet. Um, so even if it's not complete, a draft would be great, or it's okay to say, I'd love this letter. You know, I would be able to get you the personal statement by this date. And then in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'll write the letter around then when I get the personal statement. Um, rarely have I had the, only one time did I have a student at, at Rice who needed it before the personal statement was done. And I guess they were going to work on their personal statement up to the end. And I know that I didn't feel as jazzed about that letter because it showed me that they didn't even have a draft that they could get me. Um, which isn't like a great sign, so. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I think at least getting a draft of your personal statement or key essays for whatever the application would be, whether it's a fellowship or grad school or med school or law school, just to help us get insight into your thoughts and how you're approaching is important. It, it makes the letter better. And, and, and again, it depends on how well I know the student. So if I'm a lot of my students, I think the records, I've taught them like eight times, you know, in that case, it ends up, I, I really know that student after three years and eight classes, but in other times I've only taught the student once and, and I may not have that much of a memory built up for them. So having an opportunity for us to get a little bit of an insight into your personality and your thought process and kind of your, how you see yourself kind of helps us really get that, that letter to be more meaningful. Um, rather than like 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 Margarita said which is more st it's more sterile otherwise and it's literally just a cut and paste of you know the student did this in my class they ask questions that's good you know and i think that that makes them a good candidate so having that personal touch helps even if we don't know you super well at least the statement gives us a little bit more yeah but drafts are good. Yeah, yeah i would just say that is like super ideal situation Sometimes if they're in my lab and I know they're going to go to graduate school, I don't need to see their person like I like those are the ones if I know them really well and I know they're going to go to graduate school, they've taken a class with me, as you said, Bilal, then I feel more comfortable going, I'm going to get a head start on these because letter of recommendation time is like usually mm, October to December. And man, sometimes I write letters for 15, 20 people. And so I will like, if somebody asks me right away and they don't have their personal statement, but they've done their brag paragraph and they've given me all the other information, I can make do. 
But there's some cases where you simply can't. If they're doing an NSF, one of the things that it gets judged on is how well you say you've read over their project and you think it's doable and feasible and it's going to add to the literature. So again, um, there are times when students just don't have their shit together. The deadline came really quickly or you know, there's times where we are applying for things together for the student because we just found, oh, there's a summer research program and you've got to apply to it because the deadline's tomorrow and I'll write you the letter. And so we're doing it you know, in sync. But I think ideally it is exactly what Margarita said, which is you know, you're know, you waiting, you have all the pieces of the puzzle, you get the gestalt and it happens. But in the absence of that, you know, then you say, oh my gosh, I'm so, so sorry. Also, we like chocolate. <laughs> Especially, especially if you pulled one of those last minute things, a lot of appreciation goes a long way. And even if you have to fake appreciation, fake it. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I think say based on a lot of things that we said here, right, basically the, you're trying to help the faculty to, to or the letter writer to remember like you know the nice things about you to write in the letter i think the most recent thing that the faculty remembers on you is like hey i'm applying but i didn't have time to work on my personal statement yet because i'm a little bit late but can you write the letter for me it'll be hard to write like you know this person is really dedicated and organized you know and really well prepared for a grad school application i mean you didn't even finish your statement yet and it's not like your statement would be like much longer than like my letters definitely will not be like the, if I combine all the letters I'm going to have to write I'm going to be writing more than the student so I feel like you know it's kind of like I mean it's kind of part of your job to have a nice statement like a, I mean like it's especially for grad school application I think if you haven't even started your statement or you don't have like a reasonably good draft at the time you probably should have started a little bit earlier so especially because it's early right now so I can be honest and ask you to start early Probably if you ask me in the last minute, I would not give you the speech and say like, hey, you were late, but these are different situations, right? I think, yeah, like now, given that you have time, just start writing your statement as early as possible to make sure that when you ask for the letters, the statement looks good already. Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, whenever you're asking for the letter, if you're asking way in advance, like, like it's important just to get you know, give us a framework of when you expect it to be done like was mentioned before like i expect to have my stuff done by the end of the summer and we'll get it to you then but this is not due till october so you know that kind of you know structure and advance notice and kind of guidance will help like i'm not going to worry about it until you get that to me because i have plenty of time afterwards but there are times and we all want to help our students so i've had times where students come to me and they ask me for a letter the night before it's due and they're like I've even had them come the day it's due 3 p.m. this afternoon. They come to me at 11. Can you write something 11 a.m.? And I'm like, well, I mean, I can try. Uh, and and it, it, but, but, you know, and, and I'm not going to blame the student. I might usually you just want to make sure you're giving as much of notice as you can, but sometimes you just find something and it just wasn't available and you just saw it today and it's due today. And, but as long as you're giving advance notice and then giving us time to look at what you're doing, it, it makes sense. So, you know, giving us that information is important when when available. Like it'll just help so much. All right, y'all. Last question: uh, How can our students show their appreciation to you? What type of updates should they be sharing after the fact, after their letters, or should they be sending you guys thank you letters, giving you all updates? What do y'all appreciate in terms of that? You know what I appreciate the very, very most is when they tell us where they're going. So a lot of times the students will be like, you've written them 13 letters and then you don't have any idea where they, did they get in or where do they go? So I kind of say, in addition to those six or seven points, I said, let me know where you get in so I can rejoice with you. Talk to me if you get into more than one place so I can also help you like get excited and and finally, let me know where you end up going. To me, that is even better than the chocolate or the, the letters. Of course, you know, this is, this is the art of gratitude and there is nothing better than a handwritten message that just says, you know what, thank you. And that just to me goes a long way. This is Manners 101, but as well as that, it's really nice to know 
you know, um, where did they end up? Yes, to the handwritten letter. And I had a student, um, I've had a couple students who when they study, maybe they're doing some program abroad, they'll send me a note from there, which has been the most hard. It's like a postcard. It takes two seconds to write just to say, thank you. Um, this Oxford experience has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. That was it. It took maybe two minutes to write and to send, but there's something really kind of nice about also seeing maybe where they, like if you're able to do that, if it's a kind of program that offers that opportunity. Um, I've had a couple students do that and I remember them. I have them in my office kind of hanging. It's a really kind of lovely touch to what can be a really arduous process for everyone. Yeah, and I agree on on, on all the count. I think, I think just showing gratitude, the easiest way is like, we're writing this letter to help you get something. So knowing about it, good or bad, you know, say, oh, you know, I unfortunately didn't get it, but thank you for writing the letter. Um, I may apply next year and I'll reach out, you know, so... But if you get, obviously, if you get, and I've had it where the student got a, a fellowship and I found out like third hand from like a month later from the fellowships committee. And then they're like, oh yeah, I just, I found out. I'm like, yeah, you found out a month ago. So it would have been nice to let me know, you know, but, but really, yeah, just letting us know handwritten cards are some of the common things that I've gotten just thank you notes and, 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 and really in the end, just letting me know how things are going, what your plans are. It just lets me know whether what I'm doing is actually having an impact or not. Like, was my letter good? You know, if, if obviously if you get a program or get a fellowship or get into grad school, then I know I'm not completely messing up my letters um, or hopefully not. And so it's just, it's just a nice way. It's also just a way to connect with that faculty a little bit more. Like you said, you were asking about growing and, and, and what you can gain from this process. And that's part of it is kind of building that connection with somebody that you continue to have contact with after grads, uh, after undergrad, even though you didn't have as much to begin with, but this letter writing process can build that relationship. Yes, yes, I think I agree with the, the comments you made before. I think, I, mean, I think the, the first thing that you have to do to show gratitude is to put together a good application. Again, like if you see that your application looks very nice, I'll be happy, excited to write a letter for you. If it doesn't look that nice. I mean, the whole, everything else would not, uh, so I think put together a good application, that's one way. I mean, like when I uh, applied for grad school, I sort of rec make sure that I, I made sure to recognize everyone like who wrote letters for me, like throughout the way. So when I wrote my thesis, like my dissertation, I wrote like, you know, thanks for these people who wrote me letters, you know, I say I wrote like some article in the news in my university. And then I mentioned like these people wrote me letters. Like then recently I went to my university back, I went to their office and say like, you know, this is what I'm doing right now. Thanks for those letters, you know, like they became part of my career, you know, and I think they liked that, you know, and I went, when I got the offers, I went to them um, to ask for advice and say like, oh, this is the offers that I have. It doesn't mean that I followed their advice necessarily, but I feel like they, they were excited to be part of it, you know, and they feel like they feel they are part of my career now forever. And as you progress, you're going to be asking for more and more letters. So there'll be more and more people that will be sort of like a support team for you know, advice, for like coffee, for like, you know, just to see how you're doing. And, you know, and I think this is nice. And so that's the way that I found to try to be grateful, just to keep these people aware of what I'm doing. And, and that's, that's it. Yeah. I was going to add one more thing to that. I Every once in a while... I run into a person who is, who will say, oh, I was going to ask you to write a letter again, but you already did that that one time and I felt bad. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? Like if I write a letter for you, it is so easy for me to update it and repolish it. So once you have somebody committed to supporting you, please feel free to go back. And, you know, nothing is so joyous. I think you kind of mentioned this, Bilal, which is, you know, it's really lovely when you write something for someone who's a sophomore, and then later you get to update it. And then you see, oh my gosh, look at how far they've come. So never, never worry about going back to somebody you've asked to write a letter and to ask again, because that's what our, our, our saved files are for. <laughs> and it'll be a better letter. I was going to bring that up too. Like it's going to be an infinitely better letter because we have all that we already wrote plus everything we get to add. It's going to be fantastic. So those prioritize those people who clearly you've developed a relationship with. All right, y'all, we're at seven. 
Uh, so I just want to make sure we close out for everybody, but really, really appreciate the panel here today. They gave some amazing insight. Um, and of course, this will be recorded as well. So if any of you come across students who want any more advice on letters of recommendation, you can say, well, I've talked for an hour about it. So I'll, I'll share with you the link on that. But appreciate you all so much. Have a great evening. Thank you for holding this, Chris. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Everyone, good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.